Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. You are, get ready, buckle in, because this is going to be fabulous. Uh, this morning, the Humanities and Social Sciences Division is happy to host today's speaker, Lauren Brooke Eisen. Um, Eisen is with us today through the Pulitzer Center, which is a media organization that focuses on international issues. For the Pulitzer Center, Eisen traveled to New Zealand and Australia to look at the prison systems. In addition to her work with the Pulitzer Center, Eisen is senior counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, a nonpartisan law and policy institute that seeks to improve systems of democracy and justice. Eisen's works in the justice program at the Brennan Center, where she focuses on improving the criminal justice process through legal reforms, specifically works on how the criminal justice system is funded. Eisen has a long history of working in the legal system and has published the book, Inside Private Prisons, An American Dilemma in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Before we hear from Ms. Eisen, I would like to turn it over to Fareed, who works with the Pulitzer Center, who will give us a little bit of background on that center. Thank you very much. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Um, so my name is Fareed Mostofi, and I work with the Pulitzer Center, who had the privilege of helping to support some of our guest speakers' funding. Oops. Um, so can I get a show of hands? Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. This. There we go. How many of you, raise your hand if you have never heard of the Pulitzer Center before? Yeah, I, I get that answer a lot, and I understand. So please help me spread the word. The Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., and what we do is want to we want to make sure that those stories that aren't getting covered in the headlines of the news outlets that we check, those important underreported stories, that they're getting told. And we do that by doing two things. The first thing that we do is we give grants to journalists. Um, and so we want you to know that because anyone in the room today who wants to travel the world to investigate and report on something that is not getting enough attention or a place that you can get money <laughs> to travel to cover the costs of, of your reporting. We work with journalists who've already come up with ideas with reputable news outlets. Last year, we supported 150 projects in 129 different news outlets. So the, it's not about the outlet. It's not about it being a front page breaking news story. It's about it being important. Uh, well-researched and reported ethically and checked. Um, and then once uh, those stories are funded and then published on the sites of the outlets that, that are publishing them, the second thing that we do is outreach um, and education to make sure those stories get out, which is why we're here. So um, if you're curious about what stories you might be missing, if you're just getting to see most of your news in news alerts on your phone, Check out Pulitzer Center's website, pulitzercenter.org. We also are really active on Twitter and Instagram. In fact, if you want to meet the journalists directly like you will today, we hand over our Instagram at Pulitzer Center to a different journalist every week who's received funding and they just post their work. This is a pretty cool week for us. One of our stories uh, just won a Pulitzer Prize yesterday. Um, a really important story from the Associated Press on Yemen. Definitely check that out. But if you have any questions about the center and the work we do, I'll be here after so that you can uh, ask me some questions. And you at Forsyth Tech have a really important role in our mission because you are a part of our campus consortium partnership, which means that your school not only supports bringing journalists to speak to you, but actually supports a student from your community going into the world to report on an underreported issue. So um, we actually have our student fellow who received a grant to travel to Turkey in the audience. She can raise her hand. You can give her a round of applause. She's going to be traveling this summer. Um, reporting uh, on an issue that I know in our office when we read her application we didn't know a lot about uh, and that fellowship I believe will be available to students next year as well so definitely talk to um, your professors about how you can get involved but without further ado we're here today because out of these hundreds of stories that we've supported there's one that connected really well to your school and your mission and the journalist who reported that story is here. So without further ado, can we give a round of applause to our guest and bring her to the floor, um, Lauren Brooke? Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Brooke Eisen, Senior Fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice, and thank you for coming out um, early this morning. I really appreciate it, and congratula congratulations to the journalists in the audience. Um, 
So I just wanted to start with a little bit of a primer on criminal justice and punishment before I go into some of the um, research that I've been doing that's been funded by the Pulitzer Center. So raise your hands if any of you are majoring in criminal justice, um, any sort of criminal justice class major, a couple. Okay, raise your hand if you've had any class on criminal justice before. Okay, okay, great. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about the purpose of punishment, and I think it's really relevant because this project is ultimately about prisons. And um, you know, we'll talk about some of the statistics in the United States that some of you are probably very familiar with at this point, um, but I just wanted to very quickly talk a little bit about the four purposes that, um, the four purposes of punishment, and most of you are probably familiar with retribution, right? And retribution is this idea um, that crimes deserve to be punished. Um, so, you know, this is a, a comic book strip, right? Um, and I don't, I don't mean to make light of it, but the idea sort of is biblical, right? An, an, eye, an eye for an eye, retribution. Um, someone punches you, um, you know, you feel like they need some sort of punishment. So when we talk about punishment in general, you know, retribution historically um, has been one of the four purposes. Um, and then there's incapacitation. And that's what um, many of you are probably very familiar with. Incapacitation removes someone who has violated our criminal code from society. And incapacitation um, today, when you hear incapacitation, um, you know, what do you think of? You can just shout it out. Prisons, jails, sort of incapacitating someone. That is really our dominant form of punishment today in the 21st century. Um, you know, we incapacitate people to the tune of 2.2 million people in the United States are currently incapacitated as we sit here today. Um, another goal, sort of traditionally, historically, of punishment has been deterrence. Um, and that is to pre prevent people from committing crimes. So the idea is if you know that you could go to jail or prison or get probation or have to pay a very, very hefty fine, you would be deterred um, from committing a crime. And there's been a lot of research in the last decade or, show, or so that shows that deterrence actually doesn't really work. Um, a lot of crimes are sort of crimes of passion um, or, um, you know, crimes where, you know, the research shows that deterrence um, doesn't actually prevent people from committing crimes. And then there's the fourth goal of punishment, um, which is rehabilitation. And that goal is to give someone the tools, the education, the help they need so that they can reenter um, society the best that they can so that they are successful citizens, um, that they won't commit crimes in the future. And in the United States, um, rehabilitation has not really come to fruition. Um, so there's something called recidivism. Um, does anyone know what recidivism is? Don't be shy, raise your hand. Yes, in the back. Okay, so, so he said someone who commits a crime over and over again. So the definition of recidivism is uh, when you return to someone who is released from jail or prison, returning to jail or prison. That's recidivism. And we measure that in terms of recidivism rates. So in the US, does anyone know what our average recidivism rates are across the country? Do you think they're low or high? Exactly, they're very high. So our recidivism rates are about 40 to 60 percent. So what that means is that almost two thirds of people who are leaving our jails and prisons are returning behind bars within three years. And most states in our country measure recidivism based on return to prison within three years. So we're doing a pretty lousy job of rehabilitation in this country. And that's because most of our prisons just don't have the resources, the programs, 
to ensure that people are better off when they leave prison than they were when they entered. So in a lot of our prisons, there's a um, there's long, long waiting list for drug treatment, for mental health treatment, um, for any sort of program, educational program. If a prison is lucky enough to have you know, GED programs or secondary education, prog secondary education programs or college level programs, there are incredibly long waiting lists. Um, so this is, this is a big problem for our country. We are incarcerating 2.2 million people about 700,000 in our local county jails. About 1.5 million people are incarcerated in state prisons. And about 170,000 people are incarcerated in federal prisons. So that number in totality is about 2.2 million. And so a lot of criminal justice researchers use the phrase mass incarceration. And that phrase really sort of embodies this this astronomical level of people behind bars. Um, we in the United States have 5% of the world's population. So of the people alive today on this globe, the United States has 5% of those people. Our country holds 25% of the world's incarcerated people. So we lead planet Earth as the country's, as the globe's biggest jailer. So why care about mass incarceration? Well, there's the fiscal cost. We spend $79 billion a year on corrections as a country. One in 35 people in this country is under some form of supervision. What that means is that they're on probation or parole or some sort of electronic monitoring. Most of our states, when you look at the budget, the big circle pie, many states are spending more on corrections than they are on health care and education. There are incredible negative consequences for family members and children of incarcerated people. Um, there are many states that have passed laws disenfranchising people from voting if they have a felony conviction. And so I'm sure a lot of you have been following what happened in Florida this past election. So voters in Florida recently passed a ballot initiative giving back the right to vote for a huge portion of individuals who have been convicted of a felony. Um, but the law doesn't give the voting rights back to every person in Florida who's been convicted of a felony. There's some exceptions. It also depresses the economic power and the political voice of communities of color. In fact, so many children have been incarcerated in the United States that in 2013, Sesame Street introduced a new Muppet named Alex, who's the first Muppet to ever have a parent in jail. And this really, I think, illustrates um, the crisis that we are facing as a nation. We have so many parents incarcerated that Sesame Street Workshop, which is a nonprofit, rolled out a toolkit to help teachers, parents, children understand how to talk to children about having a parent incarcerated. 2.7 million children, or 1 in 28 children in the United States, has a parent behind bars. And so many children grow up watching Sesame Street. Um, that Sesame Street workshop thought that, you know, it was time that they introduced a Muppet um, that could relate to children of incarcerated parents. The US sends more people to prison than any country on the planet. Um, and even if we cut our incarceration rate in half, we would still have more people um, in our prisons and jails than almost every other country on the planet. 
And in fact, the Brennan Center recently issued a report finding that 40% of people in our prisons and our state and federal prisons don't need to be there if we look at public safety, and that was a very conservative estimate. So why care about the privatization of justice? Um, so we've talked about mass incarceration. Um, we've talked about how you know, the United States incarcerates more people than any other country on the planet. And the reason for that, do you think it's because people in America commit crimes more than people in other countries? Is there something different about us? The, the reason is because of our laws. Since the 1970s, we have had politicians run for election based on what's called tough on crime. So there's this sort of famous phrase that you couldn't run for dog catcher in the 80s and the 1990s unless you were seen as tough on crime. If you were running for prosecutor, if you were running for mayor, if you were running for Congress, if you were running for president of the United States, voters would only elect you if you were seen as tough on crime. Our crime rates were much higher in the 1970s than they are today. But today, in 2019, we have historically low crime rates across the country. Our crime rates, there are some pockets, there are some big cities that do have pockets of crime. But as a general matter, our crime rates are much lower than they've ever been as a country. And we have more people behind bars than we've ever had. And we have a lot of research indicating that people behind bars um, are not getting the treatment they need. Uh, they are away from their families. They are often housed in prisons hundreds of miles away from their families where their families can't visit them. And we know that prison doesn't work. We know prison tears apart families. Um, and I had been working at the Brennan Center on issues related to the incentives that perpetuate mass incarceration. So a lot of my work had focused on grant funding from the federal government that was sent to states and counties to fund um, drug task forces and fund law enforcement efforts. And I started thinking a little bit about private prisons and the prison industrial complex and was really curious about what role, if any, for-profit firms had played in perpetuating and driving mass incarceration. And that was really um, what I was curious about. That was really what drove a lot of my research. And what I started to look at was how um, incentives to create a profit certainly played a role in perpetuating prison populations. Um, I started asking questions and looking at sort of this delegation of government authority. So what happened in the mid-1980s was that about two-thirds of states were under some sort of federal court order to reduce a at least one um, prison's population. So about two-thirds of states were facing these court orders to reduce the number of people behind bars in their states because prisons at the time were overcrowded, in, inhumane, unhygienic. And directors of corrections, who run the entire correctional system for their states, were looking at their spreadsheets and realized they were going to have more and more people behind bars every year for the next five to 10 years. So they were facing a real crisis at the time. Do they raise more money? Do they ask for more money? How do they build more prisons quickly enough to house all of the people that the state was convicting and sending to them, to the Department of Corrections, to house behind bars? So at the time, in the state of Tennessee, um, a corporation called Corrections Corporation of America, it was known as CCA, was founded. And they offered to take over the entire state of Tennessee's prison population. And Tennessee was one of those states in 1985 that was facing this crisis. They had riots at the prisons over the summer. 
And ten and CCA offered to take over Tennessee's entire prison system for two hundred and fifty million dollars. That's how much they wanted to get paid. Um, and they would do this for a 99-year lease. Now, at the time, Governor Lamar Alexander thought about the idea. His wife, um, Honey Alexander, was an early investor in Corrections Corporation of America. And the, some journalists were down there covering the story in the summer of, 90, of 85. And there's a 1985 Chicago Tribune story that has a quote that I think is really prescient and really relevant today. And the quote is, there was considerable disagreement as to whether Corrections Corporation of America lobbyists roaming the halls of the state capitol last week were cavalry coming to the rescue or profiteers coming to exploit. And I think that quote is so prescient because 40 years later, the nation is still having a conversation about what it means to privatize the justice system, what it means to delegate that government responsibility of managing our prisons and jails and handing it off to private firms. Now, what happened in Tennessee was that Tennessee decided not to turn over its entire state prison system to this private firm. But the New York Times covered the story. And in the mid-'80s, the New York Times had um, you know, just a print edition. There was no internet. And they had a morning edition and an afternoon edition. And the story made the front page of the afternoon edition. And the head of CCA at the time said, we were a national story. We were on the front page of the New York Times. And after that, state after state started to pay attention to this fledgling industry that claimed it could manage prisons and jails better than the government. And remember, at the time, governments were under a court order to reduce their prison populations because they weren't doing a very good job at running their own prisons and jails. The other things that I looked at when I was doing this research are their morality. Is it moral to delegate this government authority? Is this different from delegating out trash collection? which is a government service that we delegate out to private firms. Is this different from delegating out street sweeping? And that's a question that the book wrestles with. Another question um, that I wrestle with as I did my research um, is cost-saving incentives. So the state of Florida, for example, has legislation that requires the private prison industry to save money and to save money in its private prisons and jails. So the Florida government is only allowed to contract with private firms if the Department of Corrections can prove that these contracts save money. And so one of the questions that the research wrestles with is, does that make any sense? Right? And, and I would say incarceration should be expensive. So if we as a government have decided that someone should be incarcerated, we should spend money on that person's incarceration because we want that person to have the best conditions possible, the best programming possible. But that's not how the privatization of corrections emerged in this country. It really emerged as a cost saver. And then there's the question of transparency and accountability. And in the United States, um, and I make the argument in my research and in the book I wrote um, called Inside Private Prisons, An American Dilemma in the Age of Mass Incarceration, that prisons, private prisons lack transparency and accountability. And part of this reason is because they emerged so quickly in the mid-80s when so many states were under court orders to reduce their prison populations um, that we didn't put the right regulations and policies um, into law when the industry emerged. 
And at the federal level, private prisons in the United States are not um, required to comply with what's called the Federal um, Information Act, FOIA. So they are not required to turn over as much information as government agencies are when people request them. And at the state level, there are a lot of states that don't require private prison firms to comply with their own open records requests. And there's also a, a question of transparency, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that and some of my challenges getting into these private prisons. And so I published this book called Inside Private Prisons in 2017, and it really tells the story of how the private prison industry emerged, um, how it became so entrenched in corrections and detention in the United States. So right now, about 29 states have contracts with private prisons. Um, about 18% um, of the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, population are in private prisons. And what a lot of people are less familiar with is that over 60% of ICE, of our immigration detention beds, are in the hands of the private prison firms. So we have essentially delegated out the housing of our undocumented immigrants to the private prison industry. And that's sort of a large, a large part of um, how this private prison industry emerged as well. So it's a pretty big industry. And my book ultimately finds that the way that the private prison firms in the US emerged are deeply flawed. Um, that the government never required these private prison firms to do a better job than the government did. So we don't require private prison firms to track their recidivism rates. We don't require them to have better programming than our government prisons. And we've really relied on them since the mid-1980s as a quick way to build prisons without um, raising money from government taxpayers. Um, private prisons can build prisons quickly with private capital. Um, the two biggest private prison firms are publicly traded on the stock exchange. And in my research, I ask, where were the inspiring debates in the 80s and the 90s about the delegation of government authority, um, about the proper role of incarceration and punishment? Why did we not have conversations about how to reduce our prison populations instead of just delegating the building of new prisons to the private sector? And part of it is because you know, as I mentioned, um, directors of corrections and politicians were really sort of um, up against a barrel with these court orders, and there wasn't a lot of um, there wasn't a lot of sort of deep thinking about the proper role of punishment and what we were doing as a country. Um, the mid 1980s was a time of privatization. President Ronald Reagan um, was in the White House and was a big supporter of the privatization of many government services. He um, commissioned a couple big blue ribbon panels, um, both of a couple of which focused on how we should privatize corrections and have more private jails and more private prisons. So once this book was published, um, and, and sort of in one of the chapters of the book, I look at, is there a way to contract with private prisons better? And I just want to pause here and say the world would be a much better place without so many jails and prisons. We have far too many people behind bars in this country. Uh, the Cook County Jail in Chicago is the biggest uh, mental health institution in the country. It's a jail, but so many of the people in that jail suffer from mental health issues um, that it is considered the biggest mental health institution in the nation. So many of the people in our jails and prisons suffer from drug problems, mental health issues, serious trauma. They should not be incarcerated. But the question that drove me as part of this research is 
we have private prisons right now. They are in 29 states. They are at the federal level. Can we contract with them so that we can force the private firms to produce better outcomes, to have better programs, to have better rehabilitation, to treat people better, to be more accountable, to be more transparent, and to start tracking recidivism rates. And my book suggests that every prison, private prison contract that we have today should be torn up and should be re rewritten as what's called a performance-based contract. And what that means is that these private firms will only be paid if they can perform and meet certain conditions of the contracts. If they can have a better recidivism rate, for example, than the government. If they can show better reentry outcomes than the government. So as I was finishing up the writing of the book, I called a lot of directors of corrections and said, is anyone in the US doing this? And no one was. And I had some conversations with the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. And they had started to do something similar with their, um, what they call halfway houses, where they contract with private firms to manage these facilities where individuals are on work release, you know, they're, they're places where you go right before you're released from prison. And they required the private firms that manage these halfway houses, these facilities, to show that they had better recidivism reduction rates than their own prisons. But other than that, no one in, in the US had been thinking about how to make the private prison firms do a better job. And so I had read about what New Zealand and Australia had started to do. And they had, they have these private prison contracts where the government will actually pay the firms to do a better job than their own Department of Corrections is doing. So New Zealand has one. Um, it's called the Auckland South Corrections Facility. And in Australia, um, they had built a facility. It had opened um, in the fall of 2017. So I applied to the Pulitzer Center for a crisis reporting and um, said, you know, I'm hoping to travel to Australia, New Zealand, and see, see what they are doing and see if these contracts in these prisons look any different. And they... Um, lucky for me, they provided me with this funding. And, you know, this is a really sort of, um, I think, important research. Um, but for anyone wanting to do this work in the U.S., it is sometimes hard to get um, media outlets in the U.S. interested in, in what's happening overseas. So I was thrilled to be able to get this funding. And I uh, traveled to New Zealand and Australia last summer. And the goal of my research was to look at what these countries are doing in terms of their private prison contracts that we as a country could learn from. And I didn't know, right? It was possible that I would visit these prisons, talk to people involved in creating these what they call public-private partnerships and think, they're not any better than what we're doing in the US. And I really didn't know. And I've, I, you know, now that I'm back in the US, um, it took me about nine months to get access to these prisons. And that goes to the transparency issue. And while I'm grateful that I was finally given access to these prisons, um, I spent months and months trying to convince the New Zealand and Australia governments, um, specifically the state of um, Victoria in Australia and the country of New Zealand, as well as the private firms that manage these prisons to give me access. And I was denied over and over again. So I set up as many interviews as I could with people on the ground, um, with people from the private sector, with people who worked at the prisons, with people who worked on reentry issues um, in 
Australia. I had meetings with the YMCA that was a partner with this prison. And um, I actually uh, emailed the Pulitzer Center a few months before my trip and said, I don't know that I should go on this trip. I think I might need to get back the grant money. Um, to the prisons. And the Pulitzer Center, to their credit, said, you know what? See what you can find when you're on the ground. You'll have better access and sort of as a journalist, we never know if we're going to have access to places until we get there. Um, and about a, a, a month or so before I left, I did find out that these, both of these prisons had finally uh, agreed to let me visit and talk to people who worked there and incarcerated people who were housed behind their bars. And really my goal was to view these prisons through a critical lens, examining conditions of confinement along with what might differentiate these two prisons from how private prisons operate in the United States. And in conducting this research, I spoke to dozens of people on the phone beforehand, dozens of people when I returned. Um, and these people were involved in the construction and architecture of these prisons. Um, I reviewed voluminous contracts, you know, stacked this high about these prisons. And I spoke to incarcerated people in these facilities. Now, I visited the Auckland South Corrections Facility first. This is a picture um, driving up to the prison. Um, this is a picture of the prison. And you can see it looks pretty different from what they in Australia and New, New Zealand kept calling our medieval fortresses of the US. And they kept saying, your US prisons. So. Prisons in most other parts of the country um, tend to look different from prisons in the US. And um, the reason that these prisons are so different, however, is their contracts. Um, so their contracts focus on improving outcomes of the people behind bars. If they can reduce recidivism more than the Australian and New Zealand Department of Corrections, these prisons will receive additional money. And to some people, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people over the last couple of years, that's troublesome. Why are we paying private firms more money to incarcerate people? And that is troublesome, right? We, should be, we, we shouldn't be incentivizing, right, more firms, more incarceration. But the, the idea is if we can ensure that less people return to prison in the long term, those people are better off, their families are better off, and we will save money in the long run by incarcerating less people in the future. And so these contracts, um, they charge the government if they're escapes, if they're riots, um, they actually charge them money. And all of these contracts focus on how they can reduce recidivism. So it's sort of at the core of their contracts. Um, what educational programs, what mental health and drug treatment programs can they provide that will ultimately reduce recidivism? Um, and, and you can see by these pictures, um, you know, this New Zealand prison is um, sort of the campus style facility. and. Um, this, is, this is actually a volcano um, at the prison. Um, the individuals in this Auckland South Corrections facility um, progress from living in sort of more traditional cells to living in dorm rooms. And um, they're sort of typical, um, you know, they, ha they have four bedrooms and a common area and they cook. Um, on their own, uh, they earn an allowance, they do their own grocery shopping, they are required to create resumes um, to work at the facility, and the idea is that they progress to living very independently so that they are much more ready for release um, than people are typically in most prisons and, um, you know, in the U.S. Um, I don't know of any prison that does anything like this. Um, so I walked into this, um, one of these dorm rooms, and spoke to individuals who were 
um, making stir fry and cooking and using knives. You know, in the U.S., those would be considered weapons um, and um, operating in a much more independent fashion. Um, this is an Aboriginal um, indigenous um, space. Um, so in New Zealand, they have their indigenous population, the Maori, are overrepresented in their prisons, and their contracts include um, working with, they're required to work with this indigenous, indigenous population. Um, and, you know, um, so I, I walked around this, this indigenous space and spoke to some people inside as well. Um, and the idea really is to rehabilitate um, as long as these people are incarcerated in this facility. And um, I also visited Australia and the Ravenhall Correctional Center, which is another uh, private prison in, right outside of Melbourne. And it's also a campus-style facility. And the Ravenhall Correctional Center is also a prison um, that was created and built around this public-private partnership. Um, and one thing that I found in this research that really differentiates these prisons from US prisons is that there, um, the architecture um, in building these prisons um, really focused on light and space um, and creating an environment that didn't seem like a medieval castle. Um, there are no bars on the windows in these prisons. There's just glass. Um, so they don't feel like they're behind bars in the same way that people do in the US. Um, in this Australia prison, there are uh, clinicians who um, meet with the individuals who are incarcerated right near their living quarters. So they're in sort of specific areas. Um, so, so it's sort of bite-sized areas across the prison. Um, and this is, this is a picture of the Raven Hall Correctional Center from the outside. This is a picture of the indigenous hut um, in the Australia prison. And so I came back and I've been doing a little bit of writing um, about these prisons, about this research. And I published one article in Salon with the Pulitzer Center's um, help and funding and one article in the New York Times. And, you know, so far, these prisons appear to be focused on job training and job placement and um, better programming. Some of the living condition um, accommodations provide an extra level of independence and humanization than prisons in the US. But I think we still need to ask, are these attempts at humanizing the facilities the right ones? Are they enough? And even if these models do show promise, it's important to remember that recidivism rates are merely one measure of success. They don't re reveal much about someone's quality of life when they re-enter society. Um, many people arrive in the system after it, decades of intergenerational poverty and trauma. Um, some people are incarcerated because of um, racial bias, because of bias policing, bias prosecution. And we need to do more to reduce the number of people who are incarcerated in the US and around the world. But the research is still important as we look at how to ensure that people who are incarcerated are treated more humanely, have better living conditions, and are prepared for reentry in a way that we are not doing in the US, both in our public and private prisons. Um, so these are complex contracts. These are complex issues. And, you know, again, the world would be a much better place with far less jails, far less prisons. Um, but it is important to learn from what might be working or not working from other countries.
And I wanted to make sure that um, I leave some time for questions. So I'd love to open up the floor for any questions you may have. Yes, in the front. What determines where, whether the prisoner goes to a private prison or a government prison? So in most cases, um, in the U.S., it is a decision that is made usually by the Department of Corrections, and it just has to do with what services you may need or not need. Um, traditionally, the private prison firms um, came under a lot of scrutiny um, in the past because they were required to save money, and so for a very long time, they wouldn't take people who were HIV positive. They wouldn't take elderly people, um, and that was because those populations are expensive. They need a lot of medical treatment and services and specific housing needs. Um, it depends on the state. It depends on the situation. Um, usually, it's sort of done by do they need a specific program? Do they want to be in a specific educational program or specific work program? And which prison might be set up the best? Um, in some situations, the prisons, um, you know, may want sort of a population that's easier to manage. And so, you know, certain ages or certain um, genders might go to a certain prison. Sort of a population management um, decision. Yes, in the purple. Can you tell us about your experience speaking with the incarcerated people? Absolutely. Um, so the challenges were I had to get approval to speak to incarcerated people in these facilities, and it was very, very difficult, um, especially in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, you need to um, fill out voluminous paperwork. Um, you need to explain why you're researching these people, their privacy issues. It's very, very difficult to, in, to interview incarcerated people. So what I did is I worked, um, and I didn't talk about this um, during the talk, but the YMCA in Australia, in Melbourne, has a partnership with this Raven Hall Correctional Facility and they train incarcerated people in Raven Hall, um, and they work with them as well um, in in sort of in their rec time, in their rec spaces on the basketball courts, and they also hire people once they are released from prison um, into specific jobs in one of their. Um, it, they help get people jobs once they're released and within their training program as well. So I worked with the YMCA to interview some people who had been released from Raven Hall. And then I also interviewed people when I was on the ground. I don't think the, um, you know, the correction staff who were walking me around, they didn't really seem that enthused um, or thrilled that I was talking to people, but I just said, you know, can I ask this person a question? Can I ask this person a question? And that's always hard to talk to people who are incarcerated because there's a lot of corrections people in, around. They don't want to necessarily tell you the truth. Um, but the people I interviewed who were um, released um, had, you know, they were in these job workforce programs, right? And so they felt that they were a success and that they had been, you know, given certain tools that um, helped them in their release, um, but again, that's a small sample size, so I just want to be honest about that, that because it was so hard to talk to formerly incarcerated people, you know, the people I did talk to were sort of sent to me as um, people who had had good experiences. I should say, you know, I did try really hard. I, I went on Facebook and I, you know, looked at who checked in the prisons and family members who checked in and tried to email people. Um, it was just really hard to, for me to find people on my own. Yes. I'm just curious as to, these are adult prisons, right? Yes. How do they address juvie? Because here in North Carolina, we still ha we have juvie, and they get out of juvie, they come from juvie, they go straight into adult, they maybe have a month or something out, mm -hmm. or they are tried and sentenced as an adult at 14 or 15. 
So it would be interesting to see how that how New Zealand and Australia address the juvie problem and not have them show up in their adult prisons. Yes, and, and that, so these are adult prisons, and again, these are just two prisons. So I did not study the entire Australia uh, justice system or correction system or the entire New Zealand correction system. The research here was pretty narrowly focused on are there, are there things that these private prisons are doing that are different than what's happening in the US and sort of studying these performance-based contracts whose goal was to reduce recidivism. Um, so there weren't juveniles in these prisons, but that's an excellent question. Yes, in the green. You, you mentioned about these, um, I guess, monies being uh, sent to these um, contracted prisons for reducing recidivism. Is any of that money being trickled down to the uh, to the employees or the correctional officers, or is that money just being kept at the uh, at, at the top level? So the question is about um, the bonus the bonus that is being sent to these prisons. So really interesting question. The Ravenhall prison is so new that th they have not evaluated whether or not they've been able to reduce recidivism. So the prison opened in the fall of 2017, and they haven't even, so you need a couple of years to evaluate recidivism rates. They're so new, they just don't know yet whether they will be able to be successful in reducing recidivism. The New Zealand prison, interestingly enough, um, just a, about a, a few months ago, um, has received a bonus for reducing recidivism more than the government, at least for one year. That money is sent to uh, the, it's called the Consortium of Partners. So it's uh, the private prison firm and all the partners are part of this consortium of um, groups that are involved in constructing and managing and running and operating the prison. It's not a huge amount of money, um, but I have, I do not believe it is distributed among sort of employees, but you know that's sort of a decision that these companies will have to make. And I, I asked that question because I mean I've worked with the Department of Corrections here in mm -hmm. North Carolina as a probation officer. I worked as a juvenile detention officer, and one of the things you know I often ask, how do you expect you know these workers to perform to a certain level and to buy into the program and the vision and mission of that facility? if that money's not being trickling down, excuse me, trickled down? Well, so one big issue in corrections in the United States is pay for correctional officers, probation officers. Um, correctional officers in the United States make very, very low wages. A lot of states, um, you know, are, are Almost every jail and prison is not completely staffed up, right? These are very hard positions to fill. They're very long hours and under you know very difficult work working circumstances. Government prisons and jails um, are unionized. So the correction staff in those places are in unions. In most private prisons in the US, the staff is not unionized. So the pay is much lower and they don't get pensions and benefits. In these countries, you know, the, the staff are paid a little bit more, they're treated a little bit differently. Um, and I spoke to the head of the um, Ravenhall Correctional Facility in Australia, and he said their staff is part of a union. Um, I think the union might be a little bit different or they might have different union benefits maybe than other correctional staff, um, but there are issues they're not quite the same as they are here. Um, you know, the US and in, in New Zealand, they have a little more than 10,000 people incarcerated in their entire country. Um, you know, we have 2.2 million. So we're really talking about completely different systems, but that's why I think it's so interesting to study um, these two prisons because they were a little more thoughtful than we are um, in thinking about how these prisons would operate, looking at working with community partners, you know, indigenous groups, the YMCA, Job Force, 
um, you know, groups um, at this prison in Australia. Uh, there are vouchers, housing vouchers for people who are released who have a hard time finding housing. You know, in the U.S., um, there are states that still give people five dollars and a bus ticket once they're released, and that's it. Um, you know, you might have um, mental health issues, and you're not released with a prescription drug in the U.S. You have no money to get medicine. You don't have an ID. Um, you don't have a place to live. And you know, in New York, if you're um, it's very hard to get public housing if you have a felony record. So you, the issues in the U.S. are, are much more challenging, but um, there are some lessons learned just in terms of bringing in the right community groups and support upon release. I saw a hand over here. Yes, in the gray sweatshirt. Um, I was just going to say, and, you know, when you're talking about people here only get you know, they only get $5 in a bus ticket when they get out of prison. I mean, do you think they think about that before they commit the crime and have to go to prison? So we incarcerate people in this country who really do not belong incarcerated. Um, there are a lot of people who, um, you know, they may go to prison for a very long time under what's considered a violent crime. Uh, for being in a car and their friend had a gun, okay? In New York, um, that's a violent crime. And our prison sentences are much longer than almost every other country. Um, so if you go to Germany and the Netherlands, um, people are, you know, they may commit some of the most serious crimes. They may commit murder. They are incarcerated 10 years. Do you agree with that? We incarcerate far too many people in this country and for far too long a period of time. And the criminal justice research and all the evidence indicates that prison um, often is what's called criminogenic. And what that means is that people who are behind bars are housed with people who might have committed more crimes. Um, they are away from their support networks. They may have mental health or drug issues, and they are not getting the support that they need. So if someone has, has committed a crime because of those issues, prison is not the right place, right? And, um, you know, we, um, most of our prisons and, and jails, you know, if you walk around our prisons and jails, a lot of the people there are just not getting the treatment that they need. Um, to be successful um, members of our society. Um, you know, 2.2 million people behind bars um, is, is a huge amount of people and far more than, than, you know, any other country incarcerates. And, you know, the people who are behind bars, they're just not given the um, support services that they need. Yes. How do you fix it? That's a very complicated question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, we need to. We need more money in education and in prevention, and um, we need more money to ensure that we don't have as much poverty in this country. I mean, every at every stage of. Um, the criminal justice system, you know, if you are entrapped or ensnared in the justice system, people are released, and then they have to pay fees and fines, and they're trapped in a cycle of criminal justice debt. Um, people are on probation for very long periods of time. You know, in Georgia, people are on probation for a decade, and what that means is that they're checking in with a probation officer, um, you know, every week and taking a drug test or, um, you know, they might get reincarcerated because they haven't committed a new crime, but they didn't show up to a kiosk, a probation kiosk, or you know, they had to make a decision, do I take my child to school or do I show up and meet with my probation officer? Um, people are you know, arrested for driving under a suspended license in this country every day, and many of those suspended licenses um, have been issued only because those people are too poor to pay their fees and fines. So, you know, we need to stop criminalizing poverty in this country. We need to improve education. 
um, we need to focus on prevention. Um, you know, there's so many things that are happening in terms of justice reform. Um, we need to work with prosecutors. You know, a lot of prosecutors' offices now are looking at prevention, looking, you know, deep into their case files, trying to prevent racial disparities. Um, the Brooklyn DA's office has just issued uh, a new memo, um, part of Eric Gonzalez's Justice 2020 um, campaign report, um, and they are going to, um, you know, their office has decided that alternatives to incarceration are the default, and incarceration is actually the alternative. Um, so there's a lot of work we have to do as a country, um, and it starts way before people enter the criminal justice system. Yes. Mm -hmm. So these, um, these consortiums in Australia and New Zealand included um, indigenous groups. And the idea is that they are spaces for the indigenous populations to celebrate um, some of their traditions and invite um, you know, their indigenous mentors who come in from the community who sort of lead um, you know, different conversations with them. And you know, the idea is to reconnect um, with you know, some of those people. Um, you know, I can't tell you whether you know, I don't know what the research is because these are sort of new spaces and I did speak to someone, you know, they're interesting, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, working with indigenous groups and community groups to try to improve the conditions of confinement and the um, time of the people who are spending behind bars, you know, is certainly laudable. I can't tell you if it's working. Um, I did speak to... Um, someone a couple of times who is an architect, she's um, an architect in Australia, she's a professor and she focuses on indigenous issues and uh, she has been studying the Ravenhall prison and um, doesn't think that these prisons go far enough. Um, you know, I'm no expert on sort of indigenous issues, um, but you know, it was sort of worth reporting on. Yes. Yeah, so, so the sort of the question is, is on racial profiling. Um, that is a deep um, question. And, you know, I spoke about the racial disparities in our justice system. Um, m many of the people in our jails and our prisons are black and brown. And, you know, it's, it's important to look at history um, when we talk about racial disparities. And one example is the um, discrepancy between crack and powder cocaine. So powder cocaine um, in the 90s during sort of the height of the crack epidemic was not criminalized as much as um, crack cocaine. They are the same drug at their core. And the reason for that is that um, powder cocaine was more expensive and tended to be used by wealthier, whiter people in the suburbs, in their houses, not in the streets, not in urban communities. Crack cocaine was cheaper and was used um, more openly in urban areas, in urban settings, you know, wreaked havoc in New York City streets, for example. People were afraid. And um, it was seen as this very, very dangerous drug that was dangerous and sort of this threat um, to law-abiding Americans. And so um, people would go to prison for far longer um, for the same amount of crack cocaine as opposed to this, the same amount of crack cocaine. Um, so if, if I were arrested, for example, um, with a certain amount of crack cocaine, somebody else who was arrested for powder cocaine possession um, with the same amount would go to prison for a far shorter sentence. And those racial disparities 
um, specifically with that one drug, crack versus powder, have been ratcheted down a little bit. Um, and in this, this first step act that was just passed by Congress, um, some of that retroactivity um, will be, some people will be released because of that discrepancy earlier than they would have been. Um, but that, I think, is sort of evident on how racial disparities play out in our justice system. That's just one small example. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of race, racial bias in our policing, in our prosecution, um, in our teaching and education. And, um, you know, why is that? Um, so, you know, we, we have a long history of racial discrimination in this country. I mean, we were founded on slavery. And, um, you know, race is a construct, right? Race, there's, there's nothing different about any of us. Race is a social construct. And, you know, our country has to reckon with our racial disparities and that we were founded upon slavery. And, um, you know, you can, I would suggest you read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow if you haven't read that book. Um, uh, that book really focuses on um, how our criminal justice system has, you know, been a direct result of some of our racist policies in this country. Yes. Thank you.